Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the ICO Mocktails and Masterpiece podcast. Uh, we have another segment of James Aikman's Peacemakers tonight, uh, the war interlude uh, in Eleanor Roosevelt movements uh, of this great work. Um, we're delighted to be welcomed. Uh, we're delighted to welcome somebody who had uh, really an integral role uh, in the creation of this piece, um, Mike Hallers, who is the videographer, the video artist who supplied, uh, you know, really a seamless backbone uh, to so much of this piece uh, and every movement. Uh, and, and we're delighted to have Mike with us. Mike, welcome. I hope you're doing well. Well, thank you. I am doing very well, Matthew. I'm really, really honored to, to have been asked and I'm, I'm pleased to be here. So. Well, it's been our pleasure to share uh, several movements of this broadcast um, you know, over the last several weeks. Uh, our, our listeners might recall this was premiered in April 2016. Uh, it was recorded by WFYI, uh, won a regional Emmy uh, for the documentary production of this. And as I've said over and over, it remains uh, the single biggest endeavor uh, by the ICO <laughs> and the sheer uh, size uh, of the piece itself. Uh, James has called it a filmic oratorio uh, and also the number of performers, you know, rounding somewhere around 300 uh, musicians on stage. It was really uh, an incredible endeavor. And Mike, you, as I mentioned, you played such an integral role in this. Uh, for our, our, our listeners who are just tuning in uh, and don't know you and are putting now a, a face with the name, they, they saw you on the program, they know uh, the, your work. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, and the line of work that you're in. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I wear a lot of hats and luckily those hats tend to come in really useful for, for things like this. Um, you know, so I, I have done uh, various types of media production now for over 20 years, 22, 23 years, something like that. Um, have owned a small media production company um, up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, eventually I like, so back way back when I, uh, I went through the University of Michigan, the School of Music in the Performing Arts Tech Department um, and was the first student in their then brand new media arts concentration program. So it was really interdisciplinary. Um, you know, so I studied traditional music and computer music and traditional art and computer art and engineering and film video and theater and dance. And, you know, that that right there was the perfect fit for me because I think it pretty well encapsulates who I am, what I do, like, I can't define it. I can just tell you there's a lot of hats. I wear a lot of building blocks that all fit together in different ways. So I, I do corporate stuff. I do non-corporate stuff. I do a lot with non-for-profit arts organizations. Um, and in this particular case, uh, it, it worked out that, that one Mr. James Aikman called me one day and said, all right, Mike, I got a thing. Are, are you in? <laughs> and, and I said, I don't even need the details, James. Like I'm, I'm in. Yes, absolutely. I'm in. Well, you've mentioned to me that you've worked with with musicians and artists before. So, I mean, obviously, you're innately creative uh, and can come up with uh, artistic solutions uh, and, and ideas, uh, obviously, originally abounding for you. But have you ever done anything this ambitious? We're talking a 90 minute multi movement work. Tell us about it. <laughs> this is a big piece. You, you've already said it. I will probably continue to say it. Yeah, um, I everything that I do is different in some way or another. Um, and I don't know that there has been anything that has been this kind of configuration at this scale before with this number of performers with, you know, all of these kind of moving parts. And, uh, uh, I mean, it was, I have all of the adjectives to describe, you know, the entire process. Like it was wonderful. It was stressful. It was grueling. It was rewarding. It, I mean, it was, it was all of the things, um, and no, I don't know that I have done anything at quite this scale before. And, uh, and we'll, we'll see what the future holds. <laughs> it's fascinating. You know, we've talked on a number of occasions and I've learned a great deal from you, you know, in particular about dealing with copyright law for historical uh, photos, uh, you know, and so the solutions that you found, uh, again, in this multi-movement piece with uh, so many different uh, historical figures. Uh, you came up with creative solutions when the legal obstacles were too great or the cost was too great. I know we're focusing tonight on Eleanor Roosevelt and the, the, the war sequence from this, but talk yeah. to us a little bit, if you will, about uh, some of the hurdles you had to go through and the creative solutions you had to come up with. Sure. Well, and I can relate that specifically to the Eleanor Roosevelt segment as well. So um, anybody who has seen uh, 
any of the movements from this, you'll you'll immediately recognize that none of them sounds the same as any other ones. All the musical styles, it's extremely eclectic. I've talked to James about, you know, his inclination towards writing things where he gets to explore a style in some depth over here and do something completely different five minutes later. Um, and just the kind of freedom that comes in that. And I was therefore afforded the same freedom on the visual side to say, let's do certain movements that are historical footage or photos. Let's do others that are completely original video, completely original animation. Um, some that are abstract, some that are significantly more concrete than that. Uh, so in, in this case, Eleanor Roosevelt is made completely of uh, public domain footage, a lot of old war footage out there, um, as well as other, there's a few Creative Commons licensed clips that are in there as well. So the, the challenge in this case was uh, if something is truly in the public domain and you can find it, it's available to use, right? So my approach overall for this was anything that we're doing from scratch for this piece, um, if it's original footage, original photos, original animation, we know that we can use that because we know who made it and who owns the rights. Like that's all easy. And from that point, we kind of go down the hierarchy and say, well, public domain would be next. Um, and after that, something Creative Commons licensed where it allows us to use it and then just give a proper attribution. So that was kind of the, the chain of command. And then beyond that is anything that has, you know, in, in one particular case, not this movement, um, James said, hey, it'd be really good if we could get this speech um, that this particular person made. And I looked into it and turns out the, you know, the Paramount Broadcasting Company owns that and wanted way more money than, than would work. <laughs> So we were lucky in that case to talk to some of the knowledgeable folks at, in this case, the JFK Presidential Library, who said, hey, we have snippets of that speech that a government employee took as part of a separate project. That is public domain. You can use that. So we added it you know, with that and work that in rather than you know, having to jump through all those hoops. Um, so the Eleanor Roosevelt movement here is basically all found footage. It's all public domain footage, all war footage, all, you know, um, you'll see it as we actually get into it, but uh, there is no created from scratch original uh, material for this particular uh, movement, which makes for some interesting challenges because then we have, it's a purely editing exercise. It's how can I make something with these pieces that we've found and put them together in a way that, that does what the music needs it to do. This needs to be in lockstep the whole way with the music and never feel like it's, you know, it came after the fact it was an afterthought. Um, it, it really needs to be integral and work in a kind of symbiotic way with the music. And this movement was so effective. And, and now to show it in 2020, this is the 75th anniversary year uh, of the end of the Second World War. Uh, we're going to play the war interlude movement by James Aikman. We're being joined by Mike Hallerts, the videographer on this project. Uh, this is the um, full forces, almost the full forces on stage. Catherine Krasovic, uh, marvelous mezzo-soprano is the soloist here. So let's uh, take it away with James Aikman's War Interlude from Peacemakers. It isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. Both Eleanor Roosevelt and her husband Franklin came from enormous wealth yet each had a loving empathy toward those not so fortunate. They put their country first and turned it around from the desolate depths of the Great Depression. She said, after visiting many veterans and families of those who had lost their lives, I cannot believe that war is the best solution. No one has won the last war, and no one will win the next war.
We're here with Mike Hallert's, uh, the war interlude movement and the Eleanor Roosevelt movement uh, of peacemakers, obviously very, very powerful. I remember this, uh, you know, four years removed, this is a movement that really uh, had a great effect on me, um, you know, standing in the midst of the, the, the orchestra and watching this footage. Uh, I just want to encourage any of you who are tuning in, and we've got viewers from Ann Arbor and New Jersey, that if you have a question for for Mike or I, please leave it in the feed. And uh, when we come back uh, after the next segment, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. But, you know, Mike, one thing uh, about this movement in particular that was very curious to me is uh, the blending of uh, different wars uh, and different uh, different uh, topics uh, all seem to work so effortlessly. But, you know, the creative decisions behind how you put all of this historical material together, I'm curious. Well, I, I think that early on, um as I was going through all of this old footage and, you know, I, there's hundreds of, of clips that I found. And then the process was, well, now, now what do I do with these? How do they fit together? What stuff do I use? What do I not use? Um, there's a lot of, uh, of footage out there of atomic bomb tests. And I ran into uh, kind kind of a cache of those where I said, all right, let's, let's take a look at these. And they are, absolutely horrific and somehow mesmerizing and beautiful at exactly the same time. Right. And the camera just, if it's an aerial view, it sits on that for two minutes and we watch this cloud billow up. Like, I mean, in many cases it was very floral. Uh, if you were to just kind of glance over at it and you didn't know what just happened, you might be why, why am I seeing this flower growing on screen? Um, and that struck me very early on. And I said, you know, this juxtaposition of, of kind of beauty and horror um, to show war, to show peace. We've got lots of imagery over the years of flower as a sign of peace. You know, famous photo uh, with a daisy being placed in the end of a rifle. It's, there's tons of it. I worked flower imagery into the Gandhi movement as well for similar reasons. Um, so wanting to show those in color, right, versus all of the black and white war footage, and then the war footage, I didn't want to lock us to a time period. Um, so all of it's very gritty, right? And it all has a similar kind of uh, scratched, grainy, old look to it because most of it was taken out in the field by whatever camera somebody had with them. Uh, but that same footage we've got over the course of decades and decades and multiple wars. And I thought it was important to represent that, not just a, a single time period. Um, also, and I, maybe this is spoiler alert for the next movement coming up here, but you'll, you'll start to see this first movement, the war interlude, we've seen a lot of destruction. We've seen a lot of death. We've seen you know, the worst that we can be as, as people. Um, there's times even now where it's difficult for me to sit through some of this stuff and watch the things that I worked on myself just because of the content of it. Um, and then the aria that's coming up, uh, you know, it isn't enough to talk about peace, one must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it, one must work at it. I, I felt like I needed to show work. I needed to show not talk, not just war. I needed to show us making some progress, actually putting the work in, whether it's successful or not. So you'll, you'll see um, that we start dealing with children, you know, and how do we care for and how do we teach children? You'll see that we, we have footage in there, um, you know, from, from civil rights marches. You know, all of these things contribute to peace um, and show actual work towards it. So it, it felt to me like I needed to have that kind of action uh, visible on the screen. That's very well stated, Mike. And you mentioned, uh, of course, the famous Eleanor Roosevelt quote uh, from 1951 that James used as the basis for this movement. Again, uh, with Catherine Krasovic and, and the Indianapolis uh, Children's Choir, uh, the full force is on here. Um, just to encourage anybody that might have any questions, we'll answer them with Mike Hallards when we come back. Uh, but here's the Eleanor Roosevelt movement from James Aikman's Peacemakers.
It's such a powerful movement. Uh, all of these movements really had a, a dramatic impact, but this one, the Eleanor Roosevelt movement, to see all of those people, the spoken words. Um, we're joined with by Mike Hallards here, uh, the videographer for this very ambitious project, James Aikman's uh, Peacemakers. I want to paraphrase something you said just uh, during the break when we were chatting. You know, in such uh, dark times, you know that we're we're all struggling right now. You know, we, you mentioned just returning to artists uh, for for uh, inspiration and, and and the creativity of artists in dark times has always been a resonating message uh, over many centuries. Um, and this yeah. is a piece that obviously had a uh, significant inspiration for James. The story. Uh, of its uh, inception is, is on the beginning of the DVD, how he came up with this idea. Uh, and you were working with them there at the very, very beginning of this entire creative process. You know, as we're closing things up, uh, Mike, I just want to take you back four years to the actual production <laughs> week when we put all of the pieces together. Uh, you know, we were joking. Before oh, I remember it like it was like yesterday, off. Matthew. <laughs> I remember <laughs> it like it was yesterday. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it all came off, but there were you know, you know, one of the things as a conductor yeah. that you try yeah. to do is to keep your composure on the podium, no matter what is happening. But there were a couple uh -oh moments for me trying to put all of this together with everyone. Uh, one of which was the ending of this, these four beautiful uh, poems uh, of Jimmy Carter that James um, ex set exquisitely to music. Uh, and the, the words to the poems are on the screen and it is kind of, you know, uh, they appear in the mist and then they dissolve and the next words come up. <laughs> And I'm seeing this and I'm thinking, all right, so where's the click track? Like I've done plenty of live orchestral accompaniment, John Williams movies and silent movies, but there's always gotta be some kind of anchor there uh, and, uh, and there wasn't. And you, you right. provided it for right. me at the 11th hour, <laughs> almost before we were going out to, to the concert to give me a, a counter, a time code so I could write the times because you know, no human is a metronome. We all have our own internalized sense of the pulse pushing and pulling in music. So you really saved me. That was my big uh oh moment. What about you? Did you have any like uh, um, any of those moments before when we were getting close to the concert? Oh, I mean, pl plenty. Yes, it was so the I mean, the production schedule for this, I've, I've said before that uh, I had talked to James quite a bit in advance about all this. But by the time we got down to, you know, brass tacks, so to speak, and uh, everybody who needed to, to talk about it and sign off on it, uh, we had two and a half months you know, to get everything done ahead of the already scheduled world premiere. So it was a very short amount of time. There was, you know, 90 minutes worth of finished material. Uh, it was never my intention to come in and say, well, these three movements don't have visuals to them. Like I wanted everything to be there. I wanted it to be good. So the whole thing was an uh-oh moment. Um, <laughs> and, you know, had to work with quite a bit of speed. And I've, uh, um, I'm thankful for, the collaborative relationship with James and just the amount of trust we had in each other to let that happen and let it turn out the way that it did was just amazing. Um, in production week specifically, so now that we've seen the second portion of the Eleanor Roosevelt movement, I can mention this. Uh, so the this was one of the relatively few cues visually that did not go off when it was supposed to during the show. Um, so I don't know why that was, and that's fine. There's so many moving parts, something's gonna maybe not quite line up the way you hope. So the video, the visual portion of this didn't start until maybe 10 to 15 seconds after it was supposed to. And so this is another moment where I'm super glad that you had the time code available to you and could tell, here's where the visuals are, here's where I'm at in the music and able to just like brilliantly and seamlessly, I, I gasped audibly probably, you know, if you go to the recording, there's probably a, oh no, in the, you know, from me sitting a few rows back because I knew exactly how far off we were going to be. And uh, by the time we get to the next major cue point, I mean, you, you had pulled it right up to that exact correct time without it ever seeming like, well, we have to go half speed to get there. Like it was, it was seamless. Um, and these are the things that happen when you have that kind of, of just complexity uh, and all of these moving parts and pieces. And uh, so I am thankful to you that you were able to do that in such a way that we can watch this movement and never have any idea that like some stuff maybe didn't line up the way that it was supposed to. So it comes across great. Well, when you reminded me of that, it all came rushing back like, oh, that's right. That's <laughs> one of those moments. And I'm thankful right. for my silent movie and you know our orchestral uh, film accompaniment uh, experience to, to go into that. But you're absolutely right. You know, 300 <laughs> musicians on stage, the complexities, you know, the average audience uh, in attendance wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't consider that just getting the children's choir off the stage so they didn't bottleneck 
in the wings uh, took yeah. uh, you know a lot of uh, coordination. So uh, for, for every moment, all of us are grateful that we've had this experience. Um, this piece it, it continues to resonate specifically in these uh, troubling times for for all of us here, uh, and in an effort that is absolutely worth it. And your creative uh, input, uh, your artistry in this is a large part of what uh, has made this piece uh, just so relevant and, and so touching for, for all of us. Of course, James's great vision uh, and, 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 and composition and, uh, and, and just deciding, you know, these great historical figures, uh, you know, to, to pay tribute to them was, was, was astounding. And we're delighted, uh, Mike, that this is not the end of our collaboration with you. We're welcoming you back now right, with a right. special collaboration, a world premiere uh, in October uh, with the composer that the ICO has worked with before, Renato Moya. Uh, a work about deforestation and climate change, specifically in the Amazon. And I know that both of you are working uh, together on that. Can you tell us a little bit of how it's going? Oh, sure. Uh, it's going really, really well. Uh, you know, so I, I can't say, hey, we have a finished piece and here's exactly how it all came together because, you know, the creative process being what it is, um, we talk regularly, like we've got a kind of a standing phone call um, where the whole purpose of, of that is to have conversation and to collaborate. There's not a specific agenda. Um, it's good when we can say, hey, let's move this forward. This sparks an idea. How can we get from here to here? Um, but I mean, we have had conversation at this point that ranges everywhere from, uh, you know, and I can't say that all of these pieces and parts are going to directly be represented in the final piece, but they certainly inform it. It's all context. It's all how things are built. Um, We've talked about a poem by Marge Piercy and what that means in terms of a collective we and what happens as that we expands. Um, we've talked about how that relates to, you know, widening a circle and how a tree grows ring by ring over time. Um, the, there's There's been so many topics we've covered right down to uh, recent conversations on how the Amazon itself is not necessarily the pristine, untouched, uh, thing that everybody kind of uh, mythologizes that it is like it is dependent upon people it is dependent on a bunch of different native cultures um, in order to be what it is and there's a balance in that uh, that without the people the forest is not what it is without the forest the people are not what they are so there's a lot of interdependency there um, we're kind of exploring that we're exploring uh, whose perspective needs to be heard and how do you hear multiple perspectives and how do you try not to leave somebody out? Um, we, we have talked about the very definition of privilege that when we are not located near it and we don't see it, well, then it must not exist. It's not a thing we think about. Um, so our conversations have been all of those things and more, um, which I think is going to bring us to just a really interesting, engaging, moving uh, deep place by the time that this piece is all said and done. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Ronaldo is, is great and has been doing wonderful work and the conversation is always like an absolute pleasure. Wow, that's terrific and fascinating, Mike. And uh, thank you for spending a little bit of time with us. Mike Callers, the, the videographer on James Aikman's Peacemakers, uh, this wonderful broadcast we've been privileged to share uh, over the last couple of weeks on our mocktails and masterpieces. Mike, thanks for being here. Uh, very best wishes to all of you. I look forward to, to seeing you soon. Well, thanks for having me, Matthew. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.